Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. I'm excited. Today, we have Jeffrey Eisenberg, founder of BuyerLegends.com. He's an authority and pioneer of internet marketing strategy. Essentially, he helps people convert more sales in e-commerce and convert more leads and demand generation. Everyone wants that. He's the co-author of books, Call to Action and Waiting for Your Cat to Bark, which were Wall Street Journal, Business Week, USA Today, and New York Times bestsellers. And the newest book is, I'm excited to, to dive into this, Jeffrey, is Buyer Legends Executive Storyteller's Guide. And essentially, it's the culmination of decades of trying to get stuff to always work and now you figured out how to put in 5% effort and get 60% of the results. So we'll talk about that. And in 1998, you co-founded Future Now that helped businesses such as HP, NBC, GE, Overstock, and Google generate more leads, subscriptions, and sales with the framework you co-invented called Persuasion Architecture. Jeffrey, thanks for joining me. Oh, you're welcome. It's a pleasure. So there's a lot of exciting things in this intro that I want to dive into. I always like to include a fun fact. And a fun fact about you that people may or may not know is your first language was Spanish. Yes. No, Why? Um, my parents were, um, you know, were, um, grew up and they were married in Argentina. Um, and they came here in 1962. Um, and so when I was born in 1965, you know, English wasn't on their agenda, right? What were they going to speak to me other than <laughs> Spanish? So, um, you know, my understanding, although I don't remember it, is that my mom took, sat in my kindergarten class for a while till the teacher figured out that I get along just fine. Um, but yeah, I'm, you know, Spanish is my first language. And it's completely fluent. And it wasn't until I think I was eight years old the first time that I spent a summer in Argentina that I didn't feel like, and this is very common for children of immigrants, that um, that I wasn't Argentinian. Because what's what's fascinating is, you know, you, you pick up all these things, especially as a kid, right, from your parents, their prejudices, their values, their all, all their stuff, right? right. And um, it was when I went down that I realized that, yeah, no, I was a little bit different than maybe a second or third generation American born kid, right? But I was way different from any Argentinian kid, right? I, you know, um, you know, I, I, re, I reacted badly when I watched Adam West in Batman what? dubbed to Spanish, right? It just, oh. right? Or, um, you know, I just, I was much more of this culture than that one. I gotcha. But, um, but it's an interesting thing to grow up in. America. Yeah, tell me about yeah. growing up as a son of immigrants, because you're, you're first generation. I am first generation. Yeah. So, so my brother and I, and most people know my brother way better than me, right? So, so um, Brian Eisenberg, who most people, who most people know better, because he's been the face of the business for, for longer, um, he's four and a half years younger, and he has a slightly different experience really? than I do. Um, well, you, you know, I spoke in English to him. Right. So while his his Spanish is almost as fluent as mine, mm. um, you can hear that he that that, um, that he has an accent. You still might think that he's native, but you might ask, "What age did you come to the United States?" Really? Yeah, yeah. Whereas um, when people hear me speak, unless they're actually Argentinians or Uruguayans, which are very similar. Um, they suspect that I'm from there. And if they're from there, then they can hear the differences. Maybe I don't use the same current slang or that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. right? But essentially, most people would not know that I am not. So it's it's a really fluent... Mm -hmm. What was different with your upbringing because they were immigrants in the U.S.? You said, you know, you get their it's values, just, their prejudices, yeah, yeah. and everything. Um, so... I, I, I'll, I'll give you a funny one, right? Yeah. Um, I hate root beer, okay? <laughs> and I hate root beer out of a prejudice that my parents have that I only understood when I uh, when I visited Argentina. So here's, here's the thing. When we have cough medicine, our cough medicine is usually um, uh, has a cherry flavor, right? It's disgusting, but it's... It's gross, yeah. Cherry is what what's used to mask... 
the grossness. Um, in Argentina, um, it's whatever goes into root beer, that's the flavor that's used to mask I medicine. Yeah, yeah. And so they would always say this tasted like medicine. Well, I had no frame of reference for that. But I don't like root beer because I think that it tastes like medicine, and it's and and it's not it doesn't taste like any medicine I ever experienced, you know, until I was sick once. I think I was a teenager when I had visited, and somebody gave it to me and said, "Ah, so that's what they mean." Right, right, right. right. So that kind of thing is very different, you know, or personal space. What about right? so um, Latins kiss everybody? They hug. They get too close to you. Right. And um, and it's a really weird adjustment because I probably require less personal space than most Americans, Mm -hmm. but way more than most Latins. Right. Um, I don't know whether to give you a hug or to give you a handshake. Okay, And so it always feels a little awkward. I know what you mean. (laughs) Um, I like that, Jeffrey. So I want to hear about the persuasion architecture. So persuasion architecture was what really um, curious, um, I'm going to say we were smart. I, and, and I hope, I, I, I'm not going to say that with any, with, with any boastfulness because I'm going to tell you in a second yeah. or in a few seconds that we were the dumbest smart people I knew. Okay. okay? Yeah. So my brother, Brian Eisenberg, my uh, colleague, uh, John Cordo von Tividar, and I came up with this with this concept and came out of a practice that was part user-centered design, um, part um, um, storytelling, which is uh, where, where we've gone now with buyer legends. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of parts, but basically we picked some very interesting terminology, terminology that conflicted with other groups. But here's the bottom line. The sites that we helped build or the sites that we helped optimize with it yeah. got hundreds of percents of improvement. Yeah. But it could not be done without a huge amount of effort, a huge amount of time, which obviously translated into a huge amount of money, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so what happened is it really only the really big companies became interested in it or really small companies that we had pity on and convinced us to do it Anyway, right? So it never really took on. When we did our book, um, Waiting for Your Cat to Bark, that was our second uh, New York yeah. Times bestseller yeah. in 2000. I've had people tell me they absolutely love that book. Um, it's it's dense. It's my favorite of our of our books. Is it? Okay. Right? It's dense. It's, um, it, it's hard to read. Um, but if you have the patience, you can get a lot out of it. Okay. Right. Um, I'd like to say it's like nine or 10 books. Okay. Mm-hmm. We, we took all our ideas and we crammed them in there. Right. And, and unlike call to action, which was a collection of essays that were very practical, yeah. this is a theoretical construct. This is explaining persuasion architecture and why it fits. Mm-hmm. And it's not really what, theoretical though. Cause you used it with these companies. Yeah, yeah, no, but it's a construct, right? It's a, it's a framework, not a, um, you know, in call to action, we might tell you, you, you know, things like um, do this if you want it to work. Or, you know, when we, we had a chapter in there that was um, 20 tips to, to improve your shopping cart, right? Yes. Uh, there's no such a thing in waiting for your cat to bark, right? Gotcha. It's more about if you understand this concept that we had called persuasive momentum, mm-hmm. okay, Um then it would work. And persuasive momentum, by the way, is an interesting concept. We've carried that into our buyer legend concept today, um, which is this idea that people have that everything's a numbers game, right? Because they think of this funnel, right? The funnel goes like this. Right. But it's dangerous. When you use a metaphor, you attach meaning to the metaphor that's not necessarily appropriate to the thing you're describing. Yeah. For example, in funnels, yeah. the reason stuff you pour stuff in the top and it comes at the bottom is this concept called gravity. Right. Okay. Yeah. There is no gravity. I've heard of it. Yeah. In hyperspace, there is no gravity in hyperspace. The so only, it should be like set on its side. Should the funnel be on yeah, its side? The, yeah. The only thing that keeps people moving is their own wanting to. Right. I mean, it's it's right. basically their own motivation, right. and so. What we what we were teaching was that event, and, and and we eventually described it as a conversion trinity. But think about it this way: at every point, you don't have a gun to your head, right? No guns to your head. 
that's I mean, we, we can make a lot of money doing that, but I, I think we'd go to jail, right? Probably, yeah. But when you don't have money uh, 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 onto people's heads, what you're asking is, is something that they're seeing relevant first, right? Because if it's not relevant, I'm not interested. Correct, yeah. The second thing I want to know is, do I find any value in it, right? Like, okay, it's relevant, but is it valuable? Right. And then, do I know what to do next, mm -hmm. right? Think of that as a call to action, but it could be a micro call to action because in a funnel, it's not a, you know, like a genie blinks and it's all done. There's processes that take place. Right. So every single hyperlink, right, every single navigational element actually has an implicit or explicit question. I mean, you have never clicked on something without an expectation of what comes next. Sure. And in persuasion architecture, what we used to do is literally architect out every potential click based on how we expect you to think about it. Right. Right. So, um, you, you know, at the end, we'd come out with all these decision trees that came out of it, right? right? All with hyperlinks, and they'd all correspond to each other because the idea is that people always want to force people through this funnel as if it was a linear thing, and it's not a linear thing, right? Because... Um, squirrel, right? I got distracted. Or <laughs> right. you're the salesperson, right? And you think that something's really important and you want me to ask that question. But I have like three questions that I need answered that are irrelevant to you as a salesperson, but I'm not there yet, right? right, right. So if you do take me off the path, I want you to be able to bring me back on. We need to anticipate what those questions are. Right, right. Right. And so persuasion architecture was all about pathing that way. And it got very complex. Um, you know, but we had some great case studies. I mean, we did. Yeah. Tell me about one of them on how you applied or a company applied it with uh, with success. So, so what one of one of the ones is an imperfect application. And what's okay. funny is um, we had planned out this whole thing for NBC um, Universal um, um, Orlando theme parks. OK. Yeah. And so um, we were working with them, and we planned out this whole experience. But Orlando theme parks have this really unique um, complication. They have three different vendors because there are hotels. It's not like Disney where everything's done by Disney. They have Lowe's that does their hotels, right? And then they have shows, and then they have dinner reservations, and then they have rides, right? And each one of those is a separate shopping cart. Yeah. Okay. And so when we worked with them, we built a whole experience how, how we thought it should be. And then they came back and said, oh, guys, we don't have budget to finish this. Like, we can't get the development work done to create just one shopping experience. What can we do? And so we went back and said, well, all the work up to here is done. Um, and do you want to, you know, do you want us to finish it? And they said, sure and they said how long and, and how much and basically they said well what happens if we just launched it how how we've come up with it our agency at that time it was organic um our agency is really comfortable they've never received such detailed plans from anybody and they went ahead and launched and here's the really cool thing okay because we're talking about you know the nice thing with big companies is when you talk about a big increase Right. It's a lot of money. It's a lot. Yeah. Small change creates a lot. Yeah. Right. Well, no, no, no. 81% increase in top line sales. Wow. That's okay. crazy. Yeah. Um, with no change in traffic, not touching anything. 81% um, in sales. And, you know, that's, that's lots of money. <laughs> right. Um, and so that's one of my favorite stories. Because so what did you do? Perfect. Yeah, so when you, the imperfect one, what did you do up to that point for them? We basically diagrammed out all the questions that people would have. And so we found some interesting things. We helped get some primary research done. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, we learned something really weird, which was that um, methodical type personalities hate Dr. Seuss. Okay, we learned that why, by why, so, uh, why would, how would that come into play with your with your so, funnel? So that Dr. Seuss is one of their themes, one of their you know their rides. Okay, and what we're trying to figure out is based on personality style, which is part of what we do with personas and persuasion architecture. Right, right, right. Because you know, when I said this to you that we're architecting paths, 
um, what's relevant to you and valuable to you isn't the same thing necessarily as is relevant and valuable to me, right? Mm, yeah. So decision-making styles become really important in doing this. And so one of the things that we found, and we found this by accident, we were testing for this, right? But it was, you, you know, sometimes things get baked into data. Yeah. It's that people who had done, who were just much more methodical, never wanted to go on those rides, right? They, they didn't steer their kids towards those rides. Um, so we found that and we wound up doing, you know, those dial tests, um, that they do in politics, right? Where they people go, I like it or don't like it, and they're sitting there and they're dialing back and forth. Um, and we asked some personality-related questions, and we found the same thing again. And what we said is, you know, they, they, they had some promotions and some parts that led with that. And we said, look, this is a very significant portion of the population, and nothing else that they had actually had, like, a negative call. Like, you know, if you weren't interested at that time, they didn't have Harry Potter, right? But if you weren't interested in Harry Potter, it wouldn't necessarily turn you off. Right. right? But this was a turnoff. Hmm. So what we said is you can't ever lead with this. This can't be one of your lead elements because we want to bring people in. Right. And we want to make them comfortable. And, you know, if it's along the way, people will feel free to ignore it. Right. So, um, so we ba basically built them a whole different persuasion path, yeah. right, for people to go ahead and build their own experiences at. Yeah. So what were some of your methods for, because it sounds like you obviously do a lot of research on personas and you bake that into the actual site. So people get there, like you said, it's relevant and they value it. What are some right. of your methods for getting that information so you can apply it to, to the site? Because that doesn't sound easy. Uh, we really are going to go four hours right uh, <laughs> so i'll tell you what it's not easy yeah. it's not easy and and the truth is that if i got really dogmatic and said hey this is the right way to do it right. um we'd be in the same place as what i said to you we were the dumbest smart people right um, yeah so what do you mean yes, by that it, so perfection is the enemy of good enough sure okay um, you know, what we were doing in our process was really replicating something that we did by talent and trying to create process around it. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to say we overcomplicated it because the truth is that that's what it would take if you wanted to do it right, mm -hmm. you know, right? Yeah. Um, it's the right way to do it. I would still advise somebody to do the whole process. Um, but it really took a long time. It sometimes involved primary research. Um, the book we've just written, Bio Legends, is sort of the opposite end, right? You you, you teased everybody a little bit when you said five percent for sixty percent. That's what you told. Me. Those are you know exact words out of your yeah, mouth. Yeah. So I'll tell you where that comes from. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We were working with Google with their group that sold AdWords to um, um, small and medium sized businesses. Yeah. Okay. It's huge. Yeah. And it's, yeah, they're a little company. They're a little company. <laughs> AdWords. Right. I've never heard of AdWords, but yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And um, and while we were while we were working with them, um, Paul Jasemski, who, who now is at Airbnb, but then ran um, this this whole group, um, asked us to come in and help. And so we did an analysis, and and I can't go into much detail about what we found. It was yeah. different, but basically. We found with their same data, you know, they gave us a stack, like huge stack. Of, I mean, they have data. Oh, okay? God, yeah. They have third party data. And I mean, they have data. Okay. If you want data, if you're a data person. Do you have to swear secrecy? Because they probably have so much data that is. Yes. I'm, that's why I won't, I won't yeah. tell, you, to tell you that they have data. It's not a is not a uh, no no a violation of, of our uh, NDA or of professional ethics. So right. they, they gave us all this data, and we found that the way that they explained some obstacles that they were facing was very different than the way we understood those obstacles. Okay, okay, and so we were making recommendations, and Paul um, was trying to get them implemented. And one of the things he said to us is. How do I train people so that they understand, so that they get the insight that the way you're giving it? How do we do that? Um, and we we worked with them for almost two years. Um, in the first quarter, they started implementing some of this stuff, and then they ran across that obstacle, which was how do we get people to do things? Because you know, in most companies, even if the CEO wakes up one morning and says, "I want it like this," you still have to work 
with other people, right? So, right. Yes. Uh, so Paul so, said, you know, I want you to train other people. And so we started doing that. And what they saw was that it was really complicated. And Paul was the one who encouraged us. He said, oh, come on, guys, there's always a Pareto principle. Okay. He said, there's always an 80 20 rule, right? The power law. And we said, yeah, you know, I'm not, a, I, I'm not a big fan of hacks. Okay. And I, I, you know, we've spoken about this before, but mm -hmm. essentially if there's already a shortcut, yeah. okay, it's hard to shortcut a shortcut. I mean, look at a map, right? Um, you know, yeah, you might take back alleys, you might, but at some point you're going to have to, you know, drive your car through people's houses or right. That's the, and, and that's not a good thing. Right. So you can't really shortcut shortcuts. You wind up with totally forgetting what the original um, benefit was, and you wind up with just probably usually a series of steps. There's a lot of that goes on, and you know a lot of marketers push that stuff because everybody wants to hear about the seven this or the three that right. or the five right. Like just oh, cut to the chase. Give me the overnight. Yeah, sometimes life is quick just a fix. Little bit more nuanced. Nuance right. is not a four letter word. Yeah, but. He, so we said, you know, we just don't know how to do that. And he said, oh, come on. And he was very generous. Did they want you to train their staff essentially on your methods? Or what was he that's, asking you? That's, that was what it was. Yeah. I mean, we were training them, but it was taking long. Yeah. I told you, the process, persuasion architecture is complex. Yeah. And so he came, he came back and he was very patient. While we were still helping them with other stuff, he says, I'm going to cut back on our objectives. I'd like you to go ahead and think about how you can simplify this, okay? And the interesting thing is, you know, when somebody's paying you good money, okay, and they're insisting on it, and it's Google, right? right. You tend to actually do it. Like, we had, we said, okay, we'll try. And we said, well, you know, we'll legitimately try. And what Brian and I had, no less than 50 phone calls with past clients, friends, people who had gotten in touch with us, people who used persuasion architecture, people who um, had read our books and tried to do stuff. I mean, we really we went out there and spoke to people, people who we hadn't worked with directly, right. but who had been more junior when they worked with our team, okay? Yeah. And we had all these conversations, and there was very little in common with them. I mean, seriously, you want to start pulling your hair out? Okay, which is really dangerous as you get to my age, right? Um, and you look like you have, your, you have all your hair there, so I'm I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm behind you in that front. Okay, go ahead. Well, yes, what it was ten years ago, right? Yeah. Uh, but we did come up with a commonality, and that commonality yeah. had to do with personas. Okay. But it wasn't personas. It was never personas because the, there were lots of people using personas. And personas are pretty popular. Like marketers often have them, right? Right. Um, but it was what they did with personas, how they used them. Mm -hmm. The one thing that we could tell was the success factor was how people talked about their personas. And what happens is that we heard this over and over again. There is a narrative. See, part of the persuasion architecture process was we would. I, I told you we would think about every link and all the context right? Why they would get here, why they would get there. And so even though it was much more mechanical, right, there was this story part to it, right? Yeah. Were, we called it then scenario narrative, right. okay? Um, so if you read Waiting for Your Cat to Bark and you were looking for what we're doing now, you'd say, oh, okay, so this is not at all brand new, right? Um, and it didn't matter how good their personas were. That's the interesting part. Okay, all that time. What you that just is said, interesting because I would think that would be a direct correlation. But it's not absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. the, the condition for success, the main condition for success was their ability to tell stories outside of themselves. Mm -hmm. Right? Because if you think about it as a marketer, we spend all our time thinking about our subject. Okay, I think about conversion rates way more than most people think about them. Right, right. right. And, and and they're interesting to marketers. They want to know. Anybody who's listening, maybe they want to know, but they don't want to know it to the level of detail that I want to know it or spend the time with it, right? Come on. You, you know, they've got other things to do. Um, and so we become bored by certain information and we start hiding information, not on purpose, just because, you know, we get tired of For telling sure. fundamentals. Um 
And the other part is that there's an empathy component. And this is actually the key is, can I understand what you like? You know, because if I asked you like, like what's your favorite food? Me personally? Yeah. yeah. What's your uh, pers- soup probably. Oh, come on. What kind of soup? Like uh, minestrone, chicken noodle. Is, yeah. You know, if I said to you, you know, minestrone soup, that sucks. Okay. Would I be an ass or what? Because in your world, minestrone soup is really good. For sure. Right? Yeah. Okay? It doesn't matter. By the way, I like minestrone soup, right? <laughs> but it doesn't matter right. what I think, right? It's good for you. And so we, if we have the proper empathy, we understand that we're not representative of everybody else. The ability to tell stories is what creates empathy. I mean, I want you to think about this, okay? Yeah. If, I mean, we live a little far away, even if we're in the same time zone, right? But um, if there were, if we were here and a little girl fell down a well or got hit by a car, God forbid, right? But right in front of, right in front of my house, okay? We'd be all over it. We'd be outside. What can we do? You, you know, anything we could do, that's what we'd be doing, right? Right, right. And yet, there are millions of people in distress, Millions, okay? You know, more than I should I, I should say in any tor- sort of gleeful tone. It's it's very sad. Yeah. However, we don't think that way, right? We're not thinking, oh, we need to go, wait a second, we can't have this call. We need to go run and do something. And the reason is very, very basic, right? It comes down to why people are who they are and what, you know, on, on the most elemental level, um, we think first about ourselves and then our families right? And then maybe our extended families, and then maybe our tribe, which is a loaded term, it extends. But basically, anytime you get too large of a group, we can't, we can no longer relate to it, Yeah. right? The same way as you can to one. And so empathy is something that loses, that, that gets lost when you can say something like, we had a million visitors to our site last month. Well, you know, a million visitors is one million individual people with individual concerns right right, who came and had their own motivations and their own desires and their own kid pulling on on their pants saying you know i need attention right each one of those and we tend to forget that right so um empathy is a very very powerful um thing that marketers um tend to lack but not because they're nasty people it's because they don't use the tools right, right? And yeah. storytelling is the natural tool. Yeah. So tell me this, you know, for people who may not be completely familiar with personas or they are but don't do it right, can you give me an example of a persona that you came up with for, for some business in the level of detail we all should be probably coming up with personas? And then what was what was like an empathetic story that actually people told that was – working for that company so i can kind of we can kind of see it play out i probably could but i'd have to start thinking about (laughs) betray a company's personal information you know their their own proprietary you can just say like but but can you say like car industry or something you know whatever industry it is not a specific company but but i think i have a good way of illustrating this that that you understand and and why in buyer legends we're saying that it's not so important the detail. You could always deepen the detail. And please don't get me wrong. Yeah. But um, you, you know, let's let's think about a really popular television show. You know, name a couple that you like. Well, Breaking Bad comes to mind. Okay, so I don't like Breaking Bad. Okay, um, it, the, the the guy's name is Saul. Oh, the lawyer. You mean? It, I I don't even rem- I, I don't remember. Um, there's a, whatever. Um, what do you we, know? The, you know the hero of Breaking Bad, right? Doesn't actually matter who who he is because I'm going to ask you this, right? You realize that he's not a real person, right? Sure, yeah. Right, he's just a, he, he's a fictional character. Yes. And, but yet, you can remember the shows, right? You can remember the stories. You can remember his motivations. Okay, you can remember, like, you would know what not to say or what not to do with him. Sure. Okay, how could that be if he's not a real person? 
Well, he's, I guess, uh, you know, a real in the show, but not a real, you know, it's a fictional character, yeah. Great. So here's, here's the thing. What makes a persona better is the layers of detail that you could add can make it better, but it's not a requisite to make it better. So I'll tell you what makes persona better sure. is that they're well-constructed characters, okay? So, yeah, I don't want to make up information, okay? But usually you have enough information that we can take that and form it into a robust character so that it's tellable as a story. You know, we all know Robin Hood, right? You don't know tons of detail about Robin Hood, do you? No. Okay, but we've got an expectation of how Robin Hood would act and what he would do and what he wouldn't do, right? He's gallant, right? He wouldn't take advantage of a lady. Um, you, you know, he wouldn't rob from the poor, certainly, right? And we know these things, right? There's things he would do, right. there's things he wouldn't do. Why? Because it's a well-constructed character. Okay, now if we start adding in the real details that we know from our user behavior, right? From actual behavior of our customers, our users, our, our prospective customers. Now you can tune that up and make it a more valuable tool. But most personas miss the boat because what Why? they don't do yeah. is create memorable characters that we can tell stories about. And so if you can't see yourself interacting with that person, Okay, then it doesn't matter how much data is in there, right? And so that's the real differentiation. So if, if I gave you a company example, um, I know one that I can give you because it's a way long time. And I don't think they do, I, I don't even think any of the people who work with there because they're like 12, 13 years ago. So, okay, we're working with a, um, a diamond manufacturer. They have a brand, major diamond brand. Um, and they had two very conflicting personas. So I'm going to give you one. Yeah, yeah. One, one is a young woman, okay, um, who's grown up um, in the nearly affluent set, okay? Um, all her friends are getting engaged. There's a lot of big rocks, okay? <laughs> um, and she's a pretty nice woman, right? She, she there's, She's not... Spoiled. She's not anything, right? Um, and yet, there's going to be an expectation of what The Rock is for, right? How her friends are going to look at it, whether her family is going to judge it adequate or not. That's real, right? Can, I mean, you know a person like this, right? We all know a person like this. And it's not because they're empty or shallow or, right, although they may be, but we deliberately made the persona likable because you want to be able to relate and empathize, right, okay? right? And then there was this other one, another persona who had nothing to do with her because it wouldn't be her fiance, but he was an accountant, okay, a young accountant, very practical, um, never really had thought about diamonds, doesn't make a lot of money, right? Um, and he was thinking things like. Wow, that's a, almost a down payment for a house. Sure. And it looks like a rock to me. Why is it so, right? Like, And we had to speak to both of these people right. and make a compelling argument. Yeah. Okay. Good example. I like this example. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we found ways in, depending on where we push, position things on the pages, how we, how we used images. So we might satisfy her with an image. And then put text. That would scare the same image right. would scare that would him. him. Yeah, yeah. Right. That immediately released his tension. Right. Because we didn't want him to like ah, ah, four carat. <laughs> right. Um. So. Yeah. We actually took and and I remember the example really well because it was one that we used to use as a case study. Um, we used the same copywriters, the same designers. I mean, entirely same site. We helped them redesign the site with Persuasion Architecture back then. Um, and we've got over a 500% increase wow. in what to them was a conversion, okay? Their conversion was um, find a location, right? Because they were the manufacturer, right? And they wanted people to go and find the diamond. So, yeah. right? And it was simply because we, we took our time to understand. Now, there were five personas in this case. Yeah. But these two were so divergent 
that I think I've given you a reason. Yeah. By the way, it's rare that you're dealing in businesses where your personas are so divergent that I could tell a story as interesting as that one, right? Um, you know, usually it'll be the difference between, um, you know, like think about it in, in a Google AdWords sense, okay? The real difference might be their age, right? Their, a technical sophistication. But let me give you a different one that's completely that, that's different. Yeah. How about their expectations? Okay. Right? Like, they come in, one of them is looking for this to be the end-all, be-all advertising vehicle, and one of them is just thinking, uh, maybe, this will, maybe this will be something extra. Right? Maybe I'm already doing stuff. What can I... Right? You know mm. what? I want to I, I wanna just add a little bit to my business. Do you get that just... Adjusting to the expectation, right? If you're always talking about, you know, we're going to build, you know, you can boom your business. Well, there are actually businesses that can't relate to we want to grow infinitely. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, you're going to, a lot of your listeners are going to be technology companies. Okay. Technology people are all wired to how do we grow infinitely? Right. Right. How do we scale? How do we get big, big, big? And yet, most businesses out there, most yeah. of the people you interact with day to day, as soon as you leave your house or your office, um, they have lifestyle businesses. Yeah. Okay, they're happy in their lifestyle businesses. They might sell that their, um, you know, their cleaning service. They might right. sell their right, but they're not looking for for these huge exits. They're building value. They're building business. They may own a couple of restaurants, but they don't think the way that we do. They don't have that kind of scale of ambition right. and so when you use that kind of language right it scares them you off you can actually turn people off yeah okay so i'm giving you some real practical yeah. examples of how how those yeah. things are used i don't know jeffrey this gets too granular but you'll you'll let me know so okay. i'm curious you know those two personas you mentioned obviously you have to you you make it and you build the character as much as possible and you mentioned accountant I'm wondering if there is, is there a methodology of why accountant and not teacher or, or were you just throwing an example out there? You know, because I know it goes back into the research that you do and you probably came up with that for a specific reason. I don't know, maybe not. Is there something behind, how did you get there, to there actually, there actually was a, 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 but accountant wasn't the reason. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's about empathy. Okay. okay. So he could have been anything. Okay. Right? He could have had any profession. Yeah. But in telling that story, I was able to get you to think, okay, this guy, he likes to cross all, you know, dot all his I's, right, right, cross right. all his T's. He's not, he's not looking to go fast. He's looking to understand things. And when I said accountant to you, yeah. right now, I know accountants that are like party animals, and you know, Not, really. Right? Yeah, so, but the the but, stereotype is what you just yeah, said. Yeah, yeah. Very dangerous to apply stereotypes. That's why I was hesitant to tell you that I that I used it that way. Yeah. Uh, because but it is. It makes me picture a certain thing. It makes me picture someone who is more detail oriented and you know, things right. like that. Yeah. Right, but it's the danger, like with gravity. Right, when I told you about the funnel, when you use a metaphor or analogy, you carry the the a prejudiced understanding of your of what you know. Right. So accountant is slightly loaded. Yes. But it's not necessarily negative. No, no, so, no negative, yeah. Right. I probably wouldn't have used something that was loaded. In fact, if you were listening for it, when I told you about this woman, it would have been really easy to see her as a gold digger. Okay? And we went out of our way to make her likable and just put her in a context where she has family and social pressure yeah exactly right, right. Yeah. where you know even if she doesn't care and she loves this guy and you know in in theory she'd say oh he could give me you know uh, uh you, you know one out of a cracker jock box okay <laughs> i want to see whether that would really work with her mom and her friend exactly yeah right okay. yeah I like so that. right so it's really important that you be able to like those personas yeah, yeah. So Jeffrey, I have to go back. How did you get into all this stuff? Because you're, like I mentioned at the top of the interview, you're really one of the pioneers. And there's several people I've talked to who said, yeah, like Jeffrey was talking about this stuff. Brian and Jeffrey were talking about this stuff way before most people. How did you get into this conversion That's optimization? Like, What's Wait, that? Brian. Um, Brian and I um, had been in business now for about 20 years. Yeah. Okay. 
but he was obsessed with the internet. Okay, first of all, he went back to where he had a BBS when he was a 12 year old. And I, I you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure the statute of limitations is over, but you know, they, he was, they were doing crazy things back in the, um, you know, back in the 80s with what went on, you know, hacking into certain and, things yeah, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So we don't um, want to get him in jail. So yeah, don't, no, don't, don't incriminate I mean, him. Stuff, but the, you, you know, yeah. He was always part of that culture, yeah. um, you know, and he grew up with a computer and I'm four and a half years older and didn't have a computer that I worked with till I was in college, right? Yeah. It's a little bit different perspective, yeah. but we had built a model. Um, we were just interested in what makes people do things, okay? Um, and what's interesting, I was in finance and he was a social worker. And um, this is way wanted, opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah, yeah. We wanted to, we wanted to both make money, and we wanted to make money together. And here's the thing that we found: Brian's very competitive, and he had done some sales like on the side, and he always was number one, like because because Brian really likes to win. I'm way less competitive than him, but you know, don't play any game with Brian because if you win, he'll be unhappy. He'll be pissed. Okay, yeah. and if you lose. He will tease you, okay. um, and I guess you know even more with his with his older brother, right? He loves to beat yeah. me, and it's okay. You'll never hear the end um, of it if he beats you, yeah. Um, but Brian and I both figured out that we we're good at sales. Like even when I was in finance, I was I was on the relationship side. Mm -hmm. um, I built these relationships. I got them to work. I figured out what would make the other person want to do what it was that I wanted them to do, right? Yeah. And so this is what fascinated us both, right? Social work, and I was this into the psychology of sales. I mean, I, I remember when Brian Tracy's book came out that way, I was like, this is amazing. And then I went and found the real stuff. Like, if, yeah, so like what, there's, there's a whole bunch of real research out there. Yeah, what did you find? I want to hear where you learned. You know, the, I always am interested in the, when people call someone a pioneer, who did they learn from? So, so at first we learned from all the salespeople, the Tom Hopkins, the Brian Tracy's, and Zig Ziglar. Um, mm -hmm. But the interesting thing is that a lot of that stuff is and and I hate to say this is just warmed over same stuff mm -hmm. okay um, and so but we we did this for a while we had built a sales model we had built a sales training model we went in and the first business that one of the first businesses that we did was we would work with companies and offer to help them sell we would help them train their salespeople yeah. we would build them some new materials we develop a new process and we were supposed to get a, a, a share of the upside sure. um, Guess what? When companies succeeded, they didn't hold us responsible for it. They said had nothing to do with you. But it didn't work. Right. It was entirely our fault. Okay. Um, and so that model was okay. It was we were making a living because we could sell it and replace it, but it wasn't exciting. Um, and we, Brian really kept insisting that we should just focus on internet stuff. And originally, before we ever thought of, of the word persuasion architecture, we used to think of our concepts as digital salespeople. It's like, okay, when everybody was focused on eyeballs, and, and seriously, it was like a sickness back in the late 90s, right? Where people were, um, you know, only focused on traffic. I mean, for no reason whatsoever. Um, we just said, well, why wouldn't you apply the same principles? I mean, people are people. Why would they change? Because of the technology. I mean, right? Fundamentally, they're the, the same. same principles. Yeah. Okay. And so we started applying those principles, and by then, I would say, yeah, by the by the later '90s, we had started to see the um, Robert um, Caldini's, the um, you, you know B.J. Fogg, some of the usability people, mm. people who actually had Norman Nielsen and um, um, uh, or um, uh, Norm, uh, Jakob Nielsen and Norman. I don't know why I'm doing this, but um, I, if if somebody knows what I'm talking Norman about, Norman Vincent Peale, are you talking? Are you no, oh, no, okay. no, usability guys, UX okay. guys. Um, there was some science, right? There was oh, stuff yeah. that that wasn't conjecture. Yeah. Okay. That wasn't rah rah or how do we get excited or how are you feeling today? Because that yeah, stuff. the other stuff is more motivational, right? And so yeah. we really learned that there was some good stuff. There was color theory, um, and of course, copywriter had become really scientific. Right? People did a lot of testing and direct response. So we became um, experts at a lot of these subjects. Yeah. Um, 
And you know how you become an expert, by the way, if, if there's anybody who's curious, um, you can either become an expert um, by starting out an expert, right? Like literally, you know, we do it for a long time. You become an expert. Or you don't know crap about it, okay? You know you need to, okay? And so you go and you do a lot of research. You put together books. You start writing articles about it so that people give you feedback. You start applying it with clients, and sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. And that's how you become an expert, right? So we wrote books about web analytics. In fact, our book was the um, second book published, but the first book finished. We know that from because Jim Stern wrote the first book on web analytics, and, we, and ours came out right right after right afterwards. Um, but ours was written before his. Yeah. Um, and so copywriting, web analytics, we'd written a bunch of articles about usability. Um, and by the way, that used to confuse people. So in the um, user experience world, people think of us as marketers. In the marketing world, people sometimes think of us as user experience people. Right. Um, you know, they, they never know what to make of us. We're I big. agree. When I was doing the research yeah. and I put together the intro, do I call them conversion optimization? Do I call them internet marketing? Do I call them so, user user? For, you know, I didn't know either. We just think of ourselves yeah. as marketing guys, okay? Yeah. And all we're really interested in is why do people do the things they do, okay? And how do we get them to do what they already want to do? Yeah. Again, same theory, right? No gun to the head. They come to your website. They had some sort of intent. It's up to us to lose their attention, right? It's up to us to be irrelevant or not valuable or not let them know what to do, mm -hmm. right? So only we can lose the persuasive momentum. And the way that we thought about it was that you build this persuasive system, which in persuasion architecture, we're really building all the little pieces, but you have, everybody has a persuasive system, right? Whether they've designed it or not, it's just great. That's what a business is, right? A persuasive system is something that's intended, uh, a system that's intended to either change somebody's behavior or um, um, uh, attitude, right? So if you're trying to get somebody to buy, you're trying to change their behavior, Yeah. right? So we apply this concept of total quality management, right? Sort of like Six Sigma, all that kind of stuff. Right. Um, and said, well, every time that somebody doesn't do what we want them to do, it's a defect. Because right. we haven't understood what they want. You have a certain path that that you're trying to go along. If they don't do it, then you've messed up somewhere. Yeah, we, we made a mistake, right? right? Instead of saying, oh, well, right. And so it's it's a real accountability, yeah. right? Um, and it's something that we brought into Buyer Legends. We have, uh, a, a, you know, we demand that you name the metric. Because here's the thing. When you name a metric, when you actually say, we're going we're gonna to increase... Um, newsletter subscribers by 20%. Yeah. One of two things will happen. You'll do less or you'll do more. Right. Either way, you'll learn something. Mm -hmm. But if you just say we're going to increase them, what can you learn? It's not that specific. Yeah. Why the 20%? What's going to be different? What is going to change? And so what we are focused on is figuring out what matters. Right, people do a whole bunch of testing, and you know Brian um, and John uh, Court of Ontivita wrote a book called "Always Be Testing." I didn't write that book; I wrote pieces of it, but I'm not one of the authors. Um, and in that book, one of the things that that, that they're that uh, they're saying is, um, not everything is valuable to test. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, there's a very common con conception that you know that one one out of ten tests are going to succeed. Yeah, and you know who that conception um, was popularized by? You? No, people oh. who sell testing tools. Oh, yeah. Because before testing right. tools were popular, remember, we've been doing this before testing tools were popular. Right. Um, we'd have to often convince a client to build a little testing tool. They were right. good, right? Like, yeah. Hey, test, how do you do this? And when it has to matter, you can't afford to be right one out of ten times. You have to be right better than a, you know, that's not even as good as a coin flip. Yeah. Okay. And what we're saying is not that you're going to be right about the specific results, but that better than 50% of the time, you should be right about whether the variable is important. Right. 
Okay, so people want to change, make variations in my, you know, you know, change minutiae, and those tests yield results. Okay, because they're everything matters. Okay, but not everything matters the same way. Right. So what? Obviously, my next question is going to be what's important to test, and or what have you found that you thought was important that was not. So I, I, I'm going to give you an example, again, from a really old client, okay. because it'll tell you, um, I had a, a, a guy, Ethan Giffen, call me from a company called Thingamajob, which was Aerotech, a $3 billion um, private company, okay? Um, and he was like, we have no budget. My people don't understand what we're doing. He was just in a skunk's work, and he says... I want to show them that we can improve conversion rates. I read your stuff. What do we have to do? Yeah. And I looked at his site and I said, what can you change? He says, well, we can change, but not much because I'm going to need budget. I'm going to need this. I said, and I looked at the site and Thingamajob, they were contract recruiters. Okay. What that means is not that they're like a job board because they thought that they were a job board, mm -hmm. right? But rather they're actually hiring. So I said, you know, right now that says we have over, you know, like, I don't know, several hundred thousand jobs. Okay. And I said, change the words and put in, we're hiring for over same amount of jobs. I said, and also change, that was on the, on the uh, tagline yeah. part, portion of the site. And I said, also, could you put another headline that says that in the text? Okay. We, we improved their conversion, almost doubled it overnight. And it's simply because it was obvious to me that what they missed, like you could have changed a whole bunch of stuff. Right. Okay. But what they missed was the value. The copy. Yeah, yeah it was a copy, but, but, but it was intrinsically valuable to know that the difference between them and let's say monster.com at the time was monster was a job board. So you'd have to go apply and then basically monster is an intermediary. Right, okay? right, right. But when you put your, when you went on, on think of a job, okay, those are positions they were hiring for. Right. What would you prefer? Yeah, for sure. Estimate? Directly with the company. Yeah. Okay. And so that was a big difference. We increased conversions with that immediately and that took nothing. Yeah. Right. Now, Today, I'm not saying everybody would miss it, because not everybody would. There's plenty of talented people who would have noticed that, but they'd be looking at what variations, you know, because they have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, they have this testing tool, so, well, we could change this button, we could, but like, okay, no, let's pull your head out, see, daylight. Right, right. This, this is really worth testing. Yeah. Right, so what you're trying to find are the things that are really worth testing, and you know it's part of what we what we're teaching with Bio Legends, right? Is Bio Legends is all about the storytelling part of persuasion architecture. Literally, is the storytelling part with the personas and how to do it. And if in your story you can't make a compelling argument for why this matters, I mean, you know, there's always the story of. You know, for want of a of a nail, the kingdom was lost. You know the the poem, right? Yes, there's always some little thing that leads to some event, and that's why you test small stuff too. Right. But the truth is that that's a complex story. More often than not, you can't tell me how you could increase a conversion by twenty percent because something changed in color. Right. Unless you said something like in the story. Our call to action now <coughs> um, isn't very visible, and so what we do is we increase the contrast. We 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 make a distinctive shape. We add, right. So if I tell you a story like that, where I've actually done something to call your attention to it, well, man, maybe right. Maybe before you, I didn't know what to do, and now I know what to do, right. So it could become important. Mm -hmm. But if you've already got sort of a prominent light call to action button and you think that changing the cult it might make some difference but it's not gonna make a lot of difference right you know and the other thing is that when people test they're they're so hung up on accuracy on, on not on, on accuracy on precision rather right like well you know we're gonna do this we're gonna do that and the thing is that even when you have 95 percent confidence 
Okay, even yeah. if you get ninety five percent confidence in your test, um, that only that probably means that you have about a twenty five percent error rate. Because what you're saying is there's ninety five percent confidence within that sample. And it's not like they're taking that sample and running it again two or three times. And it's why, by the way, people often say, well, I made the, I, you know, we found this great conversion rate increase. And then um, we didn't see the results. Right. Like we changed it. We thought they don't see the final number. Right. And yet nobody really talks about this stuff yeah. because they're so interested in the numbers of it that they forget that. It wasn't that important in the first place. Yes, it may be, right. you know, with, it doesn't mean that one in 20 times they're wrong. It means that, you know, 5%, you know, 95% confidence. What it means is that they have a 25% error rate. If you run the same test with different samples three times, you would take that five and then multiply that by five, so that would bring it down, right? You could bring that down by running multiple tests. Well, very few companies have that kind of traffic. I mean, we worked with Google. Nobody has more traffic than Google. Right. And they had tests sometimes that had to run for weeks or even months because there were certain tests that you could not get enough traffic to. Okay. That's, yeah, so, I mean, Google can't get so, enough traffic to it, yeah. People aren't really focused on what matters, they tend to put all this focus on technology, yeah. right? And they think that, that the solution is the tool. Yeah. So Jeffrey, tell me this. That was one of my questions I was thinking about, which is, what was a time when you thought, we're going to do this, it's a slam dunk, it's going to work no matter what, and it just bombs? Like one of those things that you thought, you're going to make this change, and it's going to produce huge results, and it just... So, so I'm going to tell you, we... Hardly ever think that way. Okay. Okay. Uh, it doesn't. It's hard not to think that way, though, because if you have years of experience, like you do, I'm not saying. Yeah, but but I also have years of experience of knowing that you have to cap. Remember, I've already said to you, nuance is not a four letter word, right? Um, it doesn't mean that we haven't been really wrong, and I, I'll, I'll come up with something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so here's here's a perfect one. Okay. Today, if you have a shopping cart. Okay, we'd like you to do a couple of different things. Either one page with some dynamic stuff so that it opens up, it doesn't reveal all the all the stuff at the same time, mm -hmm. or a three page. Okay, because everything would tell you that a two page would convert better than a three page, right? Because a three page converts better than a four page or a five page. And it's just not true. Yeah, why is that? I can't tell you why, okay? <laughs> but we've done this so often yeah. that it seems that a two-page checkout just never works. And I can't tell you why. It, maybe it's jinxed. Like a three-page works better than two-page, you're saying? Yes. That's really yes. strange. Either it is do the one-page or the three-page. We have never seen a two-page checkout process beat a one-page or a three-page checkout What process. would a three-page checkout process Look like um, where, for example, where you might collect the billing or the or the shipping details later, right? So you know you can collect them all on one page, but um, or or do it in certain portions. Right. Um, even amounts don't tend to work that well. Okay. So That's five weird. works better than four. Okay, and it seems completely illogical, and it I'm does. sure that there's some rational reason why it's true. Yeah. Okay, but. Yeah, right. for it's me, it would seem two-page, you put your name and email, and then it takes you to the full page, and then you fill everything else out. But you're saying it's got to be, there's got to be like an extra... Three pages are the right way to do it. Wow. That is weird. Yeah, so so I, I can't explain that. It feels like voodoo. Um, <laughs> it disturbs us. It's like Blink, you know? It's like you have enough experience, you just, you see it, and it just works that way. There's some rationale probably behind why. Um, Brian started talking about he thinks there is some rationale. It has to do with um, how how you divide up. In other words, um, he started saying that um, that it's if you separate out the fields that way, um, um, it's you, you know there's only so many things you could put on the second page versus right. And and he started explaining it, and maybe he's right. 
Okay. But even I got tired of listening to him. <laughs> um, I don't know that he could repeat what he said. Okay. Right. Because I don't know that it matters. I, I would just tell you, you know, right. it's probably one page or three page. Yeah. So what about on okay. the flip side? But by the way, if yeah. somebody's listening and they have a two page thing that beat a, a, um, a, a, a one or a three, I'd love to hear from them. Yeah. And then I'd, I'd almost be, if they could show me the detail of that, I'd be willing to bet them almost any amount of money that I can beat their two page checkout with a one or a three. All right. We'll put that challenge. Okay. So, um, so what about on the flip side of that, Jeffrey, where you were like, yeah, we'll make this change. We'll try it out. May work, may not. And it just shot through the roof. It's happened. Yeah. It's happened. I don't remember big examples yeah. of it. Um, I guess is there like a checklist you look at before something's out the door? Like uh, we want to make sure these couple things, we definitely hit on these before. Yeah, so so our pro the, the way that we do what we do tends to be very disciplined. And so there, yeah. yes, there's talent to it, but we always check it again. Some of these things that are like little checklists for us, right? So they're shortcuts right. to know whether we've thought about everything. Right. That's what I mean. Right? Like a pilot. So, so like, you know, like I mentioned flip this thing of a conversion trend. Yeah. Okay. So I always, before I do something, I always say, okay, why is it relevant? Right? Why is it valuable? Mm -hmm. Do I know what to do next? Right? Mm -hmm. And so, and I do that over and over and over. I have checks in my mind. Like if you design a landing page, there's 10 sections to a landing page. If you have nine sections, you're missing something. If you have 11 sections, you're making shit up. Okay? The first thing I look at is, do you have these 10 sections, right? Um, and if you do, now I can look for the quality, the, um, uh, the, the, the relevance of it, the um, yeah. effectiveness. So of each, right? each section you look at that. Qualitatively, yeah, yeah. right? But I start looking at it quantitatively as well. So... Um, what are a few it sections happens. people miss with landing pages? What do you find biggest mistakes people make? Um, like, I don't know if you just threw that number out of that's a really a check. Like, you look at 10 sections or 9 sections. No, 10 sections. I mean, I can, I, I can tell you where, you, you know, there, there's a, on the brianeisenberg.com blog, Yeah. Okay. there's a, um, a, um, a couple of videos that we did that examine... Um, uh, that, that basically they dissect the, the, the anatomy of a landing page yeah. and you can see that we go ahead and compare Square and PayPal and some other things and we show you real clearly how those tens, are, how yeah. those tens work. Um, you know, and if you go into a book like Always Be Testing or um, Call to Action, we break out a lot of things. You know, there's really only um, seven things that you can test on a button. Yeah. That's it. There's seven things. I mean, and we know because we thought them through and said, you know, like you can't test more than seven right. things. With the button. Um, so um, that's about it. Yeah. So what what are a few of the ten that people should should think about? Um, so if they have a more complex sale, the 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 well, this is a, a shocking one. But one of the things that people always recommend is to leave out navigation, right? To force people to be on right, the right, right. Yeah, sure. Um, if you sell something that's complex, it actually requires thought. Um, that may or may not be the right thing. It depends what you're asking for, right? Are you asking them to sign up for a newsletter? Yeah. Eh, I don't know how much choice you have to give them, right? But if you're asking them to get involved in something where salespeople are going to start calling them and all of this, and they don't have enough information and they feel yeah. like you're hiding something from them, yeah, um, maybe you should rethink that. Yeah, yeah. So what's the uh, where should people check it out? The you said there is where you break down PayPal and Square. Well, that's on. Uh, we have a, f a few blogs. So Brian Eisenberg. Yeah. I've seen Brian Eisenberg. I've seen BuyerLegends.com. There's a, yeah, there's a few out there. Yeah. So, but I know that that, that one specifically is on Brian And if okay. you go into the archive, I think you could see it under landing page. It's 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 how something like Anatomy of a Landing. Page. Anatomy of a Okay. I want to make sure to link that up. Okay. Uh, for people. Um, so, what was next? What's the next major milestone? Because we, you know, with when you keep talking, I just keep thinking more questions. But I want to get back to 
you guys, you were talking about that you were going to companies and basically helping them do sales. Yes. So what was the next major milestone in the and Eisenberg we brothers? Off on that tangent yeah, we did. Uh, and, and just let me mention something before you answer that. Okay. I think on your site, you should put the shopping cart challenge and make people apply. Because I would love to see anyone challenge anyone for the two page shopping cart. If you can beat it with a one or a three, I, I bet you get some real high profile people who would it's, it's, it's possible who would no so, i mean they would they would no, no, it's possible right. and i care to some degree and uh, you know part of me says like oh really like who cares right so i i'm ambivalent but like you, you, you know here's the thing if if you want to read our stuff and you want to apply it and you want to make your shopping cart better go for it yeah um if you want to bring me some really new insight that i want to learn i want to know about it right but if you just if you just want to have this discussion and, and people sometimes do, um, there may be a forum for it, but most likely what you really are asking me to do is consult for free, right? So, um, right, right, right. Yeah. I, I, you have to be careful when you put something like that for out. For sure, yes. Um, you, you know, I'll I'll often wind up consulting for free because you know like to me i just know this thing i can just tell you right um but i'm not encouraging it because i don't have unlimited time yeah i agree um so what was the next major milestone you were doing the sales for companies so we had to get clients we had to get guinea pigs well it sounds like you had, you got some pretty big clients oh but before we got really big clients we got you, you, you know nobodies people people who had nothing to lose when we told them can we help stuff and we did and we got some results and then we we started um there was a, there was this um listserv called iSales at that time we started corresponding on that and then um from that came brian's click z column brian's been writing his click z column for like 14 years um you know and so we just got better known through what what now is called content marketing, right? But basically, you know, this is the way that expertise has always been sold, right? You yeah. Put your ideas out there, and you show people that you think a certain way, um, and that's what you do. Yeah. So, tell me about some of the. What would be the best one to talk about as far as successful campaigns and what you did with conversion or optimization or leads with some of those? Maybe a a smaller company, and then, you know, because I listed a couple, you worked with HP, Google, Intel, the Cancer Treatment Centers of America, GE. What would be the, what's the funnest example to talk about as far as the big companies, and then what about a small company? Because maybe people won't, can't relate to that because, they, oh, I'm not Google or I'm not you, HP. You know what? The big companies are rarely fun. Sometimes the, yeah. the story can be a little fun. Yeah. Sometimes the story could be inappropriate and fun, meaning I really can't tell that story. I see. That in a way that might not like you know sometimes what's fun is the politics that almost kept it from happening, right? Big companies have lots of politics. I'm sure you're not surprised by that, right? So in small small companies are great. Actually, medium sized companies yeah. are great because so I, I, I want to. Yeah, I, I don't want to. Yeah, because I don't want to disrespect a small company. But part of the problem with the small companies they're small. They often don't have resources to get stuff done. So. When you have um, medium-sized companies, and that could be, that's a, that's a big spectrum, right? Sure, yeah. What you want to do is just find somebody either with authority, right? Or if they don't have authority, they have to have the, uh, the testicular fortitude, <laughs> okay? The cojones to go ahead and take authority. Yeah. Right. Go do something and make changes. Yeah. Um, and so you can always find in medium-sized companies a business owner or somebody who just feels confident enough to say, "I know the right thing to do," and it's easier to, um, you know, it's easier to beg for forgiveness than ask permission. Right. Right. Which is which? If you take that attitude in a big company, you know, you can make somebody, you know, millions of dollars and get fired. In medium-sized companies they tend to be really forgiving of people who make a lot of money even if they're a little difficult right yeah so, of course so, yeah for obvious reasons but it's a it, it, you know and so um 
we have customers that we've had for years, and the problem I'm, I'm the problem coming up with is naming them. I mean, you know, you don't have to name them, but they own industry. No, so do a little research. So one of our one of our really fun customers is is a you know has been you know an Inc five um, five thousand company for years and years. They they've grown really really well. Um, what makes them fascinating is that they they've continued to work with us for over ten years. Um, every once in a while, they want to see us for a day or two, and then almost all the other communication isn't even by email; it's by instant messenger. Okay, yeah. and the CEO, who you know is now running when he started, he was running a company of three people. Now has well well over two hundred people. Right, yeah, not pretty impressive company. Um, he always says that we're his favorite check to write. Yeah, okay. Um, and it's because we provided that value. Now, that's that's not. I wish that would be the same for everybody, right? Um, but it's because he doesn't want little ideas, right? When he comes, is big ideas, and when he's instant messaging us, he's saying, "Is this is this right, or am I going in the right direction here?" And it's good because he takes away one big thing that he's going to do this year, okay, or two big things. And then he spends the rest of the year tweaking around that, right? right? Um, that's fun. And, you know, when I say big, I mean, like, we're going to launch a new product line or, um, you know, or, or we're going to outflank a competitor or, you know, what's the what's the strategy? How do we do this? What do we what content do we need to develop? What? Right. That's, mm-hmm. you know, what's fun. OK, is not so much. How do I improve? Um, you know, my shopping cart abandonment rate, okay? You know, we've we've written about this. Mo- in, in the industry, it's still a- about 70% abandonment rate. It's been that way for years. Yeah, it's um, high. Yeah, but, but, you know, I mentioned in one of our books that we had, uh, um, uh, you, you know, we, we talk about how we got an abandonment rate down to 15%, okay? Um, I work with, with clients all the time, and it's not a hard thing to get from 65, 70% abandonment rate down to about 25, 30%. It's nothing. Okay, I can do it with my eyes closed. So what do you tell people? But it's boring. <laughs> I mean, seriously, like like if, 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 if you're calling and you're a medium-sized company, you can't afford to work with us because I, I have the know-how to do it. Okay, but it's boring, and so... The scale of it, it will have a big effect on your business, but you won't like my price tag, right? On the other hand, if you're a big company, it's a no-brainer, right? Um, or why don't you just read what we wrote? I mean, seriously. So, in one of one of uh, I'll, I'll tell you, um, just a long time ago. So I don't know why I'm pulling out long time ago stories, but uh, Mahesh Jain was one of the founders of Cafe Press. Okay. Um, they were a startup. We were early on, um, and we had written about lowering, conver- you know, lowering conver- um, uh, shopping cart abandonment. Yeah, right. His shopping cart abandonment was around thirty-five percent. That's okay. pretty good, right? Excellent. Yeah, half the industry average. Yeah. Um, and remember that that in in what they do, they sell those T-shirts and stuff. Yeah, or, I know exactly what they do. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, they customize uh, T-shirts, mugs, but, you name but, but it. But you're going into an unknown brand, so you may know the T-shirt you're buying might be, you know, you know the New York Mets, but you're not actually buying from New York Mets. Now you're buying from Cafe Press. It's, sure. it's really hard to have such a good rate when you're not consistently right. with the brand. Right, right. So, um, so he called up, and you know, and and he wanted to pay us some ridiculous amount of money. Um, and even back then, it was a ridiculous amount of money. And I said, I'll tell you what, maybe we'll do it on a bet. And here's the deal. I'll take the amount of money you named. Okay? Right. But if we get you, and, and by the way, he was aiming to go below 25. Okay? If we get you that, you'll be our case study bitch. <laughs> okay? I will quote you. I will lead with you. You will talk to whoever I put on the phone as a reference. Right? And... Um, we got them down to fifteen percent, a little over fifteen percent. Um, and so, but what's on the flip side? Well, it's for a really long time. I mean, Mahesh Jain is, is, is still a friend. You yeah. know, we've kept in touch. Um, their company's gone public. Yeah. Um, you know, and he's no longer willing to take every phone call. But we built yeah. our reputation on stuff like that, yeah. right? And the thing is, you know, Cafe Press, 
had no money at the time. I mean, you know, they were struggling too, and we had no money at the time, and we built our reputations together. Yeah. Right? So it was, it's fun. Um, but I'm glad that he was competitive enough to take me up on that, right? Not everybody would have taken me up on that. Yeah. So what's on the flip side? There's no downside for you in that deal. You get the money or you don't get the percentage? Absolutely. You... You, you, here, here, here's the interesting part. That you asked a question. I love this question. Um, people who have consulting companies yeah. often ask me, what do I do when a customer wants to guarantee? Okay. And here's the thing. I can guarantee one thing for sure. I will cash your check. <laughs> Guaranteed, I will cash your check. Okay? Right. But I've got a track record. I have hundreds of successful companies that I've worked with. Now, you come to me, okay, and you've got a problem. Right? Nobody comes to me because they don't have a problem. Right? And so sure. I know how to solve the problems. Okay? Um and I don't, show, you know, I'm like, you, you know, if you watch The Magnificent Seven or you watch Westerns, right? They didn't, gunslingers didn't charge by the bullet, right? No. They charged a price and they solved the problem. You need to kill 100 people, you need to kill one. It doesn't actually matter, we'll solve the problem, right? So we were solving the problem. And the thing is that what people need to remember when they come to hire any expert, right? It's not just us, any expert is... They've got the problem because of something they're doing, okay? Oftentimes, it's not actually marketing at all. Most people who think they have marketing problems often wind up having um, merchandising problems, right? I can't pick your product, pricing problems. I don't know what, how you, you know, your, your pricing models, um, execution problems, management problems, yeah. right? But everybody looks at marketing as if it's the solution. It's going to put out the fire, so, yeah. Right. So I've got a track record. Not everybody who I've ever worked with has had success. I, and I feel bad about that. I mean, seriously, I would like everybody. We cheat a lot these days because we don't actually have um, a big agency. We've yeah. purposely kept ourselves very boutique. Yeah. Right. Because we can pick and choose. You take the clients that you can help, essentially. Yeah. That I'm yeah. pretty sure that we can win with. Because yeah. the thing is that that's how we get lots of word of mouth. I mean, Everybody who's, who, who comes to us, I mean, if you come to us and you have to ask me, what can I do for you? You're not the right customer. Yeah. You, you either know and you've, you've spoken to They know to exactly, yeah. Yeah, they know what we do. Um, or or, or they, uh, even if they don't know exactly what we do, they know us by reputation. And they can ask how specifically we might be able to help. But they're not looking to say, are you guys for real? If that's your question, then it's not the right fit. Yeah. So Cafe Press, what did you do for them? You got them the 15%. We wrote about it. We wrote about it in, in the book Call to Action. Okay. Um, we've revised the tips mm -hmm. since then. Yeah. Um, I mean, not all of them, but just one one big thing that people should look at with their shopping cart. There, there were 20 something things. There's no one big thing in a shopping cart. It's lots of little things. <laughs> you know I'm going to try and get you to say that. So, yeah. Um, no, and, and, and it's okay. Like I said, you know, there's that, that PDF is floating around somewhere. Um, I'm pretty sure that there's probably an article on BrianEisenberg.com that might be about it. Um, and if, if there's not, and somehow, you know, you email me or you tweet me or you get in touch with me on Facebook, I'll find a way to get you that information. Okay, fair enough. Um, so tell me this. What are some common, like biggest mistakes people make with, online conversion, you know, when they're, when they're even thinking about their online conversions, because you say there's a number of problems that can occur anywhere in the path and they just want to do more marketing. What's a, some big mistakes people should be thinking about even before they get to that point? Well, uh, you, you know, it goes back to why we wrote Buyer Legends. If you're not starting from the perspective of the customer, if you're not starting from empathy, you've already screwed it up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just because you're you're profitable and you're converting 2%, 3%, whatever you might be converting, if you haven't started with a process that puts the customer first, you're so behind the eight ball that it's really hard to imagine. Mm -hmm. So what's one of your favorite stories from Buyer Legends? Well, Buyer Legends is a 25-page book. It literally takes half an hour to read. So I, there's not too many stories, right? I told part of the story. The part of the story is how we developed it, right? Which is really because... Um, 
Google asked us to come up with a, a shortcut to what we thought was a little bit of a shortcut, but we found something. Um, you, you know, we had, um, when we were writing the book, we wanted to make sure that this didn't only work at Google, right? And that even yeah. though we had talked to all these people, right? So we put on a little class at Wizard Academy, which is a, uh, a school down here in Austin. Um, and we had some people attend and we told them that they were guinea pigs. Okay, we had them go through the process, and this one guy named Brian Clapp, um, who has a, um, a nutraceutical company, sells um, um, mostly around weight, um, uh, not weight, uh, um, bodybuilding type supplements. Okay, um, he went ahead and used this process, and basically spent you know spent a few hours together. Okay, um, he went back. And in the last year, he'd been doing conversion rate testing, and he couldn't really pick up his conversions by more than 10%. Yeah. He went back with our our buyer legends, what he had done with us. Remember, we didn't do them. It was a work, workshop. He did them. He, he just We just wanted to make sure that if people followed the process, that, he, that, that we were clear it works. enough. Yeah. Um, he increased his conversions by 46% wow. just from that. And my understanding is, I know that he spoke to Brian earlier today, um, is that he's done way better than that over time. But just from his very first exposure to the concept, he took that stuff and was able to increase his revenues by 46%. Yeah, wow. Uh, is that a good story? Remarkable. Yeah. The beautiful thing is it didn't require us consulting at all. Okay? Um, I have stories like that. And the thing is you can read stories like that in the Amazon reviews. I love when people read our stuff, okay, and then get great results. Because it mean it validates and, and the thank yous from that are way better than somebody who pays us to train them or tr pays us to consult with them because it validates us, right? It gives us it, it, it's there's a psychological um, good feeling yeah. to it, right? And so um, yeah, those stories turn us on. Yeah. So Jeffrey, I always ask, since it's Inspired Insider, about one of your lowest moments and then how you push through it because there are those low moments even though you work with big companies and then on the flip side one of your I, I, one of your I'll, proudest I'll moments give it to you. we yeah. were we were dead broke we went ahead and took the last company that we were involved in the future now okay um, we took that company and we did a reverse merger to go public we were turning oh, our wow. consulting service into a SaaS model um, it was actually starting to turn successful, okay? But we did that in October of 2008. And so... Not good time, um, yeah. If you were looking for funding, and, and, and we figured that we were going public because that, that would be a way to get more funding, um, that was not the time to be looking for funding. I mean, we went dead broke. I mean, you know, we weren't taking salaries. We put money in. We it was, it was a terrible time. Um, it hadn't been the first time we'd lost another another time we'd been in a business and a partner had a, you know had literally robbed us wow. um, closed the door on us. So I've had this happen twice. I mean you know I've, I've been had something going really successfully. Yeah. Low points are part of the equation. Yeah. Um, you don't know what the high points are if you don't hit the lows. Right. I mean someone who's listening who may be in that situation now, how did you push through? Mentally, because no, there's, you, you know what, you don't push through. I don't want. I don't want to give happy talk. Yeah, okay? I don't want happy talk. I want yeah, the real. I want the real deal talk. Yeah, it sucks. Yeah. Okay, and you can like. I want to hear if you were depressed in a corner for six months and then finally no, someone no, slapped you or something. No, but I don't yeah. want to look at somebody who is depressed in a corner for six months and say there's something wrong with them. Yeah, I agree. I, I, so, but um, well, just what was your method to yeah, eventually get to? Because it's. I don't know. I would I'll, think. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. One of the things is once we unwound ourselves from the company, because we walked away from it and, um, y y y you know, we didn't walk away with, with a lot of money, but we were able to walk away. Okay. Um, and, and the company survived for a few years. I, I don't think it's still in existence, but it survived for a few years without us. Um, We actually went back and said, we actually focused on our health. And, and Brian lost over 100 pounds. I wow. started doing some exercise, started losing some weight. I didn't lose as much as him, but I've, I've definitely slimmed down um, and started doing some exercise. And yeah. I worked on my relationships. Because what happens during those times is 
all the stuff you let slip are your relationships and your health. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's really hard to get good with the universe when you're not good with you. Yeah. Um, that wound up really being the focus. I like that. Yeah. Uh, and I don't have any magic word. No, if, I like if that. One of yeah. the listeners is situation. Yeah. I just, I just want to tell them, man. I know how bad it sucks. I know how bad it sucks to lose. I know how bad it sucks to do something that you're sure is going to work and doesn't work. Right. Um, you know, when we were building future now, I can still remember. You know, high fiving the first time. This is a cool story. Yeah. The very first time that we got a newsletter subscriber, okay, yeah. whose email we didn't recognize. Right. Okay. <laughs> I Everything love those moments. Exciting, yeah. Right. Um, you know, and these days, you know, Brian's building a, a, a is very involved in building a company called Ideal Spot. He's actually actively their CMO. I'm an investor and I do some business development, but very early stage startup. They're still. Um, you, you know, they're still um, um, looking for their seed round, but it's idealspot.com. And what it does is it chooses a real estate location for you. Basically, you, you put in a real estate location that you are interested in putting a, a, a store in, and it will give you the risk factor for it. It's a so great it's a name. It's a great name, yeah. Right. Thank you. Um, and so, um, and you know, and we're building Buyer Legends um, to be... Um, more of a training company. We don't actually have a, an exact plan for what it's going to be when it grows up, but it's going to be its own thing. Yeah. Um, and so we're building businesses, and you know, we we are able to survive because of all the hard work we put into building reputation. Right. So yeah. it takes a lot of effort and a lot of investment to build New York Times bestseller. Right. Everybody's a bestselling author, but do they actually get on a list? Um, you know, we did a lot of free speaking. Now we do mostly paid speaking. Right. We did consulting to almost anybody and anybody until we figured out how to get good at it so that we could work with companies, whether they were big or small, it would succeed. Yeah. There's so much experimentation. Um, you, you know, just two weeks ago, I looked at all the content that we were building for Buyer Legends and said, ah, the book's okay, but the rest of this is crap. And, you know, if you go look at the blog, you can make a determination for yourself. I think that some of it is okay, but we wanted to set a much higher standard. And so I can tell you that if you went and subscribed to BioLegends.com, you'll actually notice an improvement in the content over the next few weeks. Yeah. Okay. But it was still that moment where we said, oh, I can't believe I'm doing this. This is what it means to be an entrepreneur, right? right. This, is, yeah. this, is, this is what it takes. I don't have somebody externally who tells me what to do, okay? But I'm the one who gets to judge and feel bad. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, I want to tell you an observation I made to Brian today. Yeah. Um, sometimes there's a curse of knowledge that applies to entrepreneurs, okay? And remember, I said there are no shortcuts, but very often times you're being really hard on yourself and good enough is good enough. I see, yeah. Okay, you know, I'm not thinking that is minimal viable product, although I, I love the concept because sometimes that's what you need. I, I just think that minimal is the wrong word, right? Because viable is where the emphasis should be, right? right? Because yes. you, you, know, you can't strip everything out of it and still have it be a viable product. Yeah. But um, oftentimes just knowing too much stops you from doing stuff, right? So there's real value in just doing it. Right. It's why I don't know exactly. BioLegends is going to be some sort of training company or it may be some sort of membership site or it might be something along the lines of the SaaS that we were building before where um, where we amplify the consulting services we do behind a lot of technology so that you can so that we can magnify the amount of time we spend. But by spending less time, right, giving mm -hmm. more value for less time. Yeah, I could be a bunch of these things. And I'm also experienced enough not to really be worried about yeah. it because what You're I know open is to, if yeah. we manage the input, this is a sort of an important principle is yeah. if you focus on doing what's right, which is giving people value, right? Teaching them how to do this, right? Yeah. Somewhere or another, the output will be good, right? It might be consulting, it might be training, it might be any of these things. But if you don't focus on the input, you're sort of focusing on the output. See, if you focus on sales, 
I could sell a bunch, but then there'd be nothing left, right? I'm focused on the product, on the actual thing that's valuable to customers. And that's right. why I was disappointed in our content, right? right? So f- keep focusing on building something valuable. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that's, that's important. Yeah. So, Jeffrey, what's been one of the, you look back on your career, what's been one of the proudest moments? Um, proudest moment. Yeah. So I mentioned Wizard Academy, and um, I was very inspired by my mentor, and he happens to be one of my best friends, uh, Roy Williams. He built a, it's a 32-acre campus. He's built all this stuff. And very early on in the academy, he had invited us to come speak and teach a class there. And I've got to tell you, out of all of those moments, the idea that he would say, would you teach these people, I mean, I just remember standing there the first time and being really choked up and barely able to speak because I was yeah. um, for clout, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's just like I was really, really just overwhelmed and awed by this idea that I would be standing there and these people would be listening to me like they were listening to my mentor. Um, yeah, that's that amazing. was a really proud moment. Yeah. Um, another one was when we hit the New York Times bestseller list for the first time, we self-published that book. Yeah. And we actually, look, we worked hard thinking maybe we had a remote chance, you know, like, like you know, if, if hell froze over just a little bit, right, <laughs> just a little thin sheet of ice, we could get it. Um, and we just outstripped all expectations. Um, but those are big moments. I'll tell you, they're, they're really, really, the, the moments, I told you the one before, yeah. It's the one where people touch my heart when they heard me say something yeah. or they read something and they come and they come to me, they come up to me and they say, hey, Jeffrey, you know, if it wouldn't be for this, I wouldn't have succeeded in this. If I can actually, whenever I actually impact people's lives in yeah. any positive way, um, there are lots of little proud moments. They outstrip all those other ones. Yeah. No, I love that. It is, yeah. So if, you, if, if, if if you come see me speak someplace, please come do that because that like makes makes it worthwhile. Yeah, Jeffrey, this has been amazing. I really appreciate it. I have one last question, but oh, is this the zinger? No, no zingers. I think we've we've we touched some of the zingers, um, okay. but tell people where 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 are a couple sites. Where should they check out? Where should they go? I know so, we have buyer. We talked about buyer. We talked about a bunch of sites, but what are a couple that so people? So Yeah, um, is where we're writing about marketing for the most part, right? There's also BrianEisenberg.com, yeah. um, and again, it's always been BrianEisenberg.com because he's been because of SEO reasons. Just so you know, when we left that agency, it had to be BrianEisenberg.com. But we both have blogged there, and we have a lot of uh, a lot of stuff there. It's some of our older content is there. Yeah. Um, if you're just interested in checking us out, um, LinkedIn, Facebook, yeah. uh, on Twitter, I'm Jeffrey Grox. Brian is the Grock. Yeah. Um, get in touch. We're, we're, we're surprisingly easy to actually get in touch with. I can't always promise that I've got extra time, but I, I try and give attention yeah. to anybody who asks for it if yeah. I can. You're very quick. And um, I would encourage anyone, I've talked to some high profile marketers, conversion experts, and they love your books, Call to Action, Waiting for Your Cat to Bark. So people should definitely check out those. And then obviously the Buyer's Legend, uh, Legends book. Uh, it looks fantastic. I'm definitely going to dig into it. I was looking for all your books on Audible because I consume everything on Audible. And, yeah, me and, too. And that's because I was going to listen to it before here, but I, I didn't see them so, on so, there. So I'm going to tell you because I love Audible yeah. books. Yeah. Okay. And and seriously, if I pull up my phone and, and and show you, I mean, right now I could go away for like three months and I wouldn't be finished with just the books I have loaded up for yeah. an emergency, right? Yeah. Um, Buyer Legends might lend itself to that, but it's a really yeah. practical little book. I think it should. I buy. I'm, I'll buy it in a second. I mean, um, but but it's but call to action would probably not. There's too many illustrations. Mm. Okay. And waiting for your cat to bark would probably need a new edition. Yeah, I'd want to rewrite. If if you went and read waiting for your cat to bark, you'd want to re you, you'd want to read through quickly through the first three or four chapters. Yeah, and so 
it's not done, but I'll, I'll consider that. Yes. Fire. Maybe we should do I went one. straight to there and I was going to consume it a couple times, whatever you had on there. And unfortunately, you know, the edition will, will, will let you uh, do it as, uh, you know, text to speech. Yeah. I'll read it if it's 25 I, pages and put it on Audible. I mean, it's, it's got to be on there. Um, but yeah, love it. And so my last question is this, Jeffrey. Obviously, I haven't even asked about your brother that much. I want to know what's the toughest part about working with Brian and what's the best part about working with Brian? Well, the, the, the best part is, you know, I love him and I trust him. Okay. And, yeah. you know, and he's one of our best friends. And yeah. so, this, you know, so building stuff and we've just yeah. been doing stuff for so long that... Um, because working with family is there's a nuance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, I gave you the I gave you the good stuff. Yeah, was, yeah. Right. The, the bad stuff is he's family, right? Um, so, so you know, so neither one of us thinks anything of saying, you know, oh, I can't do that because I got to take care of the kid, or because I got to do this, or um, I have a headache. I can't deal with it right now. You would never say that to another colleague, right? Right. Or you, you, you know. You, you wouldn't necessarily snap at each other, but in general, we, we tend to be really good. We had one biggish fight in our whole time. We made up a day later. Yeah. Um, you know, we just, it, it's, it's way better than working with strangers. Um, and then there's some parts that sometimes get a little uncomfortable, yeah. right? Because you know each other too well. I mean, yeah. that's the thing. You know each other too well and you could push each other's buttons if you chose to push each other's yeah. buttons. You know, and, but it's more of, it's hard to surprise each other, right? It's hard, you, you know what what he knows or what I know. Um, you, you know, I know what he's going to do good. I know when he's going to be on time. When he's going to miss a deadline, like uh, right. So um, you, you know, the the really good thing about him is that he absolutely loves being out in public. And while I don't mind doing what we're doing right here. Yeah. I'm a lot more reserved. I I'm much more introverted than he is, hmm. right? And so while, you don't come across as that introverted, honestly. So you're thinking shy. Introverted really means that, like, if I go to a networking party, I'm that guy in the corner yeah. thinking, "Is it time to leave yet? Have I spent enough time here so I can leave now?" <laughs> right. Okay. I don't like that kind of thing, and I don't. I like interaction with people, but I like it to be more contained. Um, and so he loves to go speak out there, yeah. right? He likes big crowds and meeting people. And it's great that I have a brother and a partner who does, right? So, yeah. yeah. Jeffrey, I want to be the first one to thank you. I really appreciate it. You know, thanks for all your valuable insights. You're very welcome. Yeah. It's my pleasure. Yeah.